one of the hallmarks of CPPD is chondrocalcinosis. So calcification within cartilage, it can occur within fibrocartilage, here it is within the menisci of the knee, but it can also occur within hyaline cartilage, here it is within an elbow joint, you can just see that fine rim, often very speckled CPPD, speckled calcifications in the hyaline cartilage, here it is at the wrist, classic speckled calcifications within the triangular fibro cartilage. Think of CPPD as an intra-articular phenomenon within the joint itself, and that's why it can lead to joint destruction. So here it is, this is at the wrist, it classically causes a radiocarpal joint appearance of osteoarthritis, so joint space narrowing, subchondral sclerosis, geode cyst formation. You'll know that the most common spot for osteoarthritis at the wrist is usually this first carpometacarpal joint here. You can see that looks normal. So this is atypical for just your standard osteoarthritis, an unusual joint associated with calcification of the triangular fibrocartilage, almost certainly CPPD related. You'll see that there's also often widening of the scapholunate interval here, and you can get proximal migration of the capitate, like a slack wrist. So the differential for this case would probably be post-traumatic. Has this patient had trauma, scapholuminate ligament rupture, and then degeneration secondary to that? Or more likely, if there's no trauma, this is probably due to CPPD. So you've got a patient who's febrile, they've got a cough, they've been treated with a few courses of antibiotics, things aren't going away. On the x-rays, there's these opacities that kind of come and go. And on the CT, you've got these peripheral regions of quite geographic consolidation. You've got beautiful air bronchograms. It's a relatively lower zone distribution. And as you sort of scrolling through, you kind of get fixated on this area and you're like, ooh, it's a bit ground glass in the middle, it's a bit consolidation around the outside. You want to call it the atoll sign. And then you said atoll, so you want to call it organizing pneumonia. And that's good, because that's what it is. But the atoll sign is not at all specific for organizing pneumonia. It's a classical description. It's a thing that you want to say. But in fact, it occurs in plenty of things. Plenty of pulmonary infections can give you this. That's not the point. The point is that you've seen these migratory opacities. It's non-responsive to antibiotics. It's organizing pneumonia. The important thing to understand about an abscess is that physiologically, it's a fundamentally different process to a glioblastoma or a metastasis, where the enhancement is the pathology in the latter two. Whereas in an abscess, the enhancement are the elves. That's your brain trying to keep the pus contained. And so it's a physiological organized response all the way around the invading horde. So let's have a look at an abscess. So we have a complete sphere of enhancement. And on the middle slices, where you're not getting much partial voluming, it's really quite regular. It'll usually be a bit thicker towards the cortex, where there's more blood supply, a little bit thinner towards the ventricle, and eventually it'll point to the ventricle and discharge into the ventricle, and you get rip-roaring ventriculitis, and the patient will die usually very quickly. You might get some little pockets of additional pus that sort of get walled off. And when you look at T2-weighted imaging, superimposed on the enhancing margin is a complete T2 low ring. And this is due to cytokines and free radicals released by all those monocytes in that defending border. And you can see it on SWE as well, susceptibility weighted imaging. It's very uniform. There might be tiny little areas of irregularity, but it's a complete line, not little segments, not just blotches. Again, because this is a organized physiological response. In this case, you've got, again, deep lobe lesion, not as large, less mass effect on the parapharyngeal fat, but clearly lateral to it. And you can see it's inseparable to the deep lobe parotid, but it's very irregular in its shape. It's multilobular. It's not just one oval. So you go up, and again, it's confined in there. It's well circumscribed throughout its extent. You look on the T2. Is it T2 very hyperintense? Is it T2 a little hyperintense? It's very hyperintense on T2 very well circumscribed, solid lesion enhancing. It fits the imaging features most consistent with the pleomorphic adenoma, and that's what it is. And the pleomorphic adenoma is allowed to be multilobulated, but it should always be very bright on T2 and should always be very well circumscribed. In children, we've got to remember to look at the metaphyses for lucency, because what we're looking for here is discontinuity of the cortex, lucency of the underlying bone, um, abnormality 
of the physis in infection. We can do an MR which will show widespread edema, both sides of the physis, abnormal physis, lots of inflammatory change in the soft tissue, and in this case, non-enhancing central component, which on CT we see is a bony sequestrum. When we've got infection, we're looking for whether or not there are any complications of that. Is there a subperiosteal collection that the surgeon needs to go in and drain? Is there a bony sequestrum that needs to go in and drill out? MRI is the best first test because there's no radiation involved. Um, but CT is sometimes really helpful to make the decision about whether there's a bony sequestrum.